um, we're going to move ahead. Um, again, this is a workshop. This is not an action uh, activity here. This is informational. And as everyone remembers, we had a report to the board two sessions ago, two meetings ago. And this is a response to some of the issues <coughs> that we brought up at that time. And Dr. Wilcox, do you want to introduce your team? Uh, certainly. First, let me uh, thank the board members for scheduling this workshop today because clearly we have some conversation that we want to have with you based on our last meeting. So let me set the purpose. Um, our purpose today is to explain our plan um, that we call a digital learning plan. And, and notice that digital learning plan um, is a deliberate choice. We didn't call it a tech plan, although I will admit early on I referred to it as a tech plan. But as I talked to our leaders, they began talking about, you know what, it doesn't matter about the boxes. What really matters is, are our kids learning? Are our teachers better able to convey that which needs to be learned to them? So uh, it was a conscious and deliberate choice. What reflect, and it, I think it also reflects our view that great teaching is at the heart of any digital learning plan or any learning plan exactly. So today you're going to hear a solid description of how teaching and learning are evolving within the district, um, evolving to rec reflect not only the changes in our curriculum, but evolving uh, to engage our 21st century learners and changing to reflect the world around us. Um, we've each listened carefully to your concerns um, and those things that you shared with us at the last board presentation, and we'll try to address each of them here today. Uh, we hope that you'll engage us in conversation as you hear things that you like and as you hear things that you have additional questions about. Today we've invited two outstanding teachers to participate in the discussion with us, uh, and that is a reflection of the fact that several of the teachers sitting on this board said, I want to hear from teachers. Um, and so we've asked one elementary teacher, Dave Warrenfeld, and one high school teacher, Jill Lawson, to be with us today. Um, we asked them here, quite honestly, not just because you asked, um, because we think it's important that we hear the voice of teachers in this process who not only understand the pressure that's placed on teachers today, uh, but have found ways to blend not just the changes in our system, but they've also found a way to integrate appropriately triage technology and move students ahead academically. A couple of other points, if I may, um, before the presentation begins. Um, we've been working on adding technology to our best practices since the first day in my tenure here. Um, this is not then a new initiative, rather it is an initiative that has finally achieved a critical mass within the district. And we believe is ready to be embraced more broadly by the majority of teachers in this district. And we'll share those numbers with you in a little bit about how we think that it is more than just one or two or a few zealots that have embraced technology, but rather it is a sophisticated majority of folks who really want this initiative to roll forward. Um, I also want to share with you that this doesn't represent a radical new expenditure. Uh, rather, it represents a modest addition, additional investment of dollars and the reallocation of currently budgeted resources. And we'll speak to that later as well. I do want to share with you that over the years, our schools have moved from slide rules and calculators uh, to graphing calculators. Um, we've moved from chalkboards and overhead projectors to whiteboards and from whiteboards to smart boards and digital projectors. We've moved from eight millimeter film some of you may remember that, to 16 millimeter film, and we thought we'd died and gone to heaven because we got the auto loader Bell and Howell projectors. Um, <laughs> we've moved from um, over the air TVs that were standalone units in our classrooms to TVs that are now uh, accessing broadband and touch screens and digital displays. Um, we have added broadband and Wi-Fi, um, and we really view the technology that we're proposing to you as simply the next step in that. I would also point out that school districts have historically simply reallocated scarce resources to embrace these new technologies. And that's one of the things that we're proposing to you here today. Um, we didn't require then great infusions of new resources, and we don't now. Um, fully de deployed, this initiative, when you take a look at $3.5 million, three years in the future, fully deployed across 22,000 students is less than 88 cents per day per student. I think we can make that investment. The question then isn't, um, will we? It's when. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the why, and then I'm going to turn it over to our group. Um, we believe that embracing this technology will make learning more relevant to 21st century learners. 
Um, we will fully align our students with the experiences of manufacturers in this community, bankers, lawyers, homemakers, truck drivers, doctors and nurses, all who use technology in their everyday life. We will give our students the skills and practice to distinguish between reliable and unreliable sources. We'll provide access to great libraries, to great works of art, and to the power of the digital age. And the question then before us is, are we, you know, are, are we going to do all that? Are we going to provide the technology and the promise that it provides to our kids, or will we simply succumb to those who are too tired to embrace the new technology? Will we succumb to uh, those who say we can't afford it? Or will we succumb to those who say, well, the pace of change is just too dramatic? The fact is that change is always around us, and the question is, can we stand still? Absolutely not, because others will pass us by. Uh, there's no such thing, really, as standing alone, particularly when you're embarking on, embarking on an event like this. Um, the use of technology in our district um, right now is almost event-oriented. It means when you can get to the computer lab, oh, you can use technology. Or when the cart rolls your way, you can use technology. We, we think that's not the way in the 21st century that technology should embrace. We think that technology should be with the kids, not that the kids should go to the technology. Um, and as I say all that, I, I know that there are probably some in the audience or some who are online who are watching this that would simply say to us, well, not every lesson deserves the infusion of technology. And we would agree that not every lesson does. There is still a place for flashcards, a simple $3 box of cards to help students understand basic facts is certainly a better and efficient, more efficient solution than a $2,000 laptop or a $1,000 laptop. None of us are disputing that. We still believe that the teacher has to make decisions every single day about when is the appropriate moment in time to use technology. And I think you'll hear some of that from the teachers today. I think you may see some of that today as teachers look in on us today over our YouTube channel and then respond in today's meet to you. So I'm going to turn it over right now to Mike Kahanik, who's going to make a couple of comments, and then he's going to introduce the team once again to all of you. And then when Mike and the team are done, I have a few more comments that I'd like to make to the board about some of the costs associated with this and some of the other challenges that we face. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Kahanik, who is the principal at Western Heights Middle School. Could I ask a question first? Would you like board members to interrupt or wait till the end of the presentation to engage in questions? Do you have a preference? We feel comfortable answering questions as you have them. Okay, and I would suggest respectfully to my colleagues that we try to share the, the floor with our other colleagues and be sure that everyone has a chance to ask a question. Go ahead, thanks. Good morning, Mrs. Brightman, Madam President, and the rest of the board members. We want to thank you for having us back here again today. To kind of outline the platform for today, we'd like you to notice that there's today's meet going on behind us. This is a back channel for teachers and educators in our system to be able to share their thoughts and perceptions of today's meetings as we move forward. In addition to that, you also have an iPad in front of you which has had an iBook loaded in it. At some point, um, a latter point more than likely, uh, we encourage you to look through the iBook and see there's everything from student and parent testimony to some of our survey data for Vanguard schools. I'd like to start this meeting by echoing our last time we met. While it won't be a focus of a lot of our conversation today, we still believe wholeheartedly in the passion that we drove last time, that this is a, a family device, that this has an opportunity to be a game changer. But we also heard loud and clear from all of you that you would like more specification specifically regarding with how this looks for the classroom, how this impacts a teacher. And most often, what we, we heard loud and clear, Ms. Fisher, uh, from some of your testimony here and behind the scenes was, what does this mean for our teachers? Can they handle this? Because teachers are, as we know, are under a tremendous amount of pressure today with everything that's going on and the revelations that's happened in education just recently. I'd like to start with our vision. This plan, the digital learning plan, is aligned to the vision created from the board. We accepted this charge from Dr. Wilcox as our leader to embrace the digital learning plan because we know that this is our new current reality. Not just for us as adults sitting here do we live in this technological world, but our kids do. I can tell you at dismissal time at any school I've been privileged to work at, watch what happens the first minute they walk out their door and you see the phones come flying out. They're slinging. The kids are digitally connected all the time. As a matter of fact, they, they're yearning for it. It's one of the most exciting points of the day, I think, is to get back on their phone. 
With that, the digital learning team decided to come up with a plan, and that's the plan we proposed before you. However, last time you shared two main concerns. The first one is, what does this look like in a classroom? It's a very difficult question, and we understand why you answer it, or asked it, because actually when you ask a lot of people, they struggle with this answer, because I'll tell you why, it's a moving target. The world is changing at a rate that many of us are even having a hard time grasping. We can't all be experts of all knowledge. It's just not possible at this point anymore. You know, I, just to echo Dr. Wilcox's message, he talked about the transformation in teaching. I started teaching in 2000 where the overhead was prevalent. It was my major tool. I don't even have any in the building anymore except for a couple in the back closet to collect dust. They're gone. I think of the, my first phone was a flip phone in 2003 because I was one of the late ones to get on board with it. And now I look at the smartphones where I can do everything, including pay my bills from my telephone wherever I choose to do it, oftentimes in my spare time. In just 10 years, we have changed more than I can even recall changing when I was a child. I remember my first VCR lasting us for 15 to 20 years in my house. Now I remember that I think in the last 15 years, we've probably gone from a floppy disk to no disk. And we can think of all the stages in between. With that saying, that leads to a difficult question. What does this mean for our teachers? However, when you look at the grounded research, and that's where we're going to say, what it means for us is student choice, flexible pacing, collaboration that extends beyond the walls of the classroom and beyond the walls of the school. Learning 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you choose. Access to resources that you normally would never have an opportunity to be, be privileged to authentic audiences with being able to talk to peers outside of the classroom, and world experiences, being able to travel around the world. I just last week saw an episode in which I went into a classroom where the students were navigating the streets of Paris on iPads. They had to calculate time, distance, and rate in a social studies class, including speaking to the, the places they visited. And they actually got to visit them in a 3D virtual tool, tour of France. I'm looking forward to taking that as I've never been there myself. The next piece was, what does this mean for our teachers? And I will say that, you know, we didn't do a good job last time presenting that we had already surveyed staff. Before we went through this Vanguard process and starting to identify the schools, we had already asked what they thought of this process. Are they excited? Are the teachers excited? And I, I'm privileged to share with you the, the data that we actually have, which is also on your iBook in your presentation that you can reference later. In the schools, we'd sit, we, when we interviewed the principals at council meeting, where we surveyed them, 100% of them said they wished to be a phase one or phase two school. The leadership around this county is excited about this opportunity. When you then dive deeper into that, we then identified 29 schools that want to be phase one, and we went through those 29 schools and through their surveys and assessing their current states, and we identified 19 schools upon that that we believed were ready to apply to be Vanguard schools. All schools, including myself, Mr. Allshire set separate from the, the team who just decided these, team, these schools. And we went through an interview process in which we had to have a representative of our community, our teachers, and our kids. When we look at the data, you will see that the schools that were selected, they picked nine based off that interview. The interviews were comprehensive, a lot of people involved. Of those nine schools that were picked out of 275 staff, only one teacher stated in their survey they weren't interested. So when it came to us last meeting about how teachers feel about this, I'm going to tell you, I was taken back. <coughs> and to be honest with you, Mrs. Fisher, I was very concerned myself. Did our survey truly accurately assess what our teachers believe? So the next thing I did is I actually went back the next day or several days later, it was on a PD day on a Friday, and I developed another survey based off some of the written questions that were provided to me from board members. And the survey was three, just three questions. One knowing that you've been through this application process, if we were to become a Vanguard school, how disappointed would you be? Now, I used the Likert scale of 1 to 10, 10 being extremely disappointed. The average for every staff member in my school, which was teachers and paraprofessionals, was an 8.9 level of disappointment. I then dove deeper and said, if, do you believe that this is an important step for our kids as teachers in our community and oftentimes as most of us as parents? On the same scale, 1 to 10, 10 being extremely important to our kids, the average score was an 8.9. And one question that really I was dying to know the answer of, and that I actually asked 
and walked out of this room, I, and I was curious to know, do you see the addition of technology into your classroom as an addition to, to complement your current effort, or do you see it as a complete separate effort? And I was pleased to say that only four of my staff members saw this as an additional effort. I didn't prep these teachers. I didn't prep this survey. I gave it to my lead teachers to administer it because I really wanted to know the truth. And I'm excited to share with you that our educators are as excited as the people at this table to bring this opportunity to the kids of Washington County Public Schools. Other things that we should consider as we're looking for feedback from our community is the social media. Currently, we have a Facebook page running, which has 527 Washington County Public staff members on board. This is one post of some of the conversations and dialogues that take place. But what's interesting is when you read into the post, what I found was very enlightening was the way teachers were helping teachers, and there was even a partnership, nice shout out to Mr. Cohen, <laughs> between IT and the teachers. As a teacher put on the Facebook page, they were struggling with an, a technical issue. IT responded on Facebook outside of school and supported that teacher so they could move forward. You also saw other teachers helping teachers in ways to experiment in this page, which I thought was just amazing. And what I also think we have to always consider is how many teachers maybe don't feel comfortable with social media but can access this social media and watch each other learn and be part of the learning process while maybe not even specifically engaging or being comfortable to engage themselves. Tremendously powerful. The next step was we then looked at research and we wanted to show you some research real quick before I turn it over to the teachers. What does the research say about one-to-one -one initiatives or computers? Is it a good idea? We've showed a link on your iBooks to Project Red. Project Red has been one of the guiding forces we've been referencing as we've moved forward. Project Red is which helped supported by the Bill Gates Foundation. Did about 900 plus schools, it was like 990 something schools approximately assessed. It assessed the effectiveness of these schools based on their computer initiatives, whether they were on statistically a three to one, two to one, or one to one. What they found was that schools that were one to one and did some core implementation practices outachieved all the other schools. What were the core implementation practices? That the classrooms use technology in every class. Now that doesn't mean every day, as Dr. Wilcox prescribed. It means when it's appropriate and when it's right. And I believe the teachers will speak to that in a little bit. It also said that principles must be the instrument of change. And we saw that firsthand. When we went to Yarmouth, Maine, we saw principals who were leaders. And then we saw, unfortunately, one that wasn't as good. The difference in the advancement of the effort from the principal down was tremendous. This change has to be facilitated from a leadership standpoint. The principals have to be instruments of change. Online collaboration took place, and this was another thing we witnessed. The relationships that had established between the teachers and the students, I will say, has been unprecedented what I saw in Maine in comparison to anything I've had the privilege of seeing in my career. It was very powerful. They all felt like they could take risks, and they trusted one another. The students felt comfortable struggling with their learning, and to be honest with you, the teachers, as I do frequently, felt comfortable saying, I don't know how to navigate that on a tech piece of technology. Student, can you help me? Core curriculum using technology at least weekly. Going into data further, we then saw what did that mean for the kids? Well, the research from the Project Red showed that disciplinary action reduction went down. This does not surprise many of us in the room as we know student engagement will go up with the digital tools. We expect that. We expect students to be on point. 90% reported higher stakes testing in state test scores. Dropout rate reduction was prevalent, and graduation was prevalent across all those schools as an increase. We then asked ourselves, well, if the data is so good for one-to-one, -one, what does it look like for Washington County Public Schools? Well, the great news for all of us sitting at this table is we've had a school who's already pioneered. And McCabe Daub has been in this initiative for several years. So we asked Mrs. Pauline if she would share some of her data. From 2012 to 2013, and then 2013 to 2014, we want you to notice the double-digit gains with writing focus with the implementation of the one-to-one -one devices that the students could use for writing and sharing their thoughts. When this is coupled with disciplinary data, we see a drastic reduction. This is the number of referrals that are 
characterized each year for four years, over a four-year period from the start of the school year through November. They used a three-month measuring window to see how their school year was launching. <coughs> you can see that the referral rate went down significantly. As a matter of fact, it was a 95% reduction in referral rate for teachers. We see that teaching these devices not only increase engagement, they also increase the likelihood of a student being off task or causing disruptive behaviors. To speak to what it really means to teachers, I think it's, no, it's very important that you hear from them. I'd like to now start and transition at this point to Mrs. Um, Jackie Cheney and Carly Pumphreys, who are going to speak about curriculum and standards and the alignment of the digital learning. Thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Carly Pumphrey. I'm a lead teacher at Fountaindale Elementary School. And I'm going to talk to you today about student learning. I'm going to focus on learning. You'll notice on the screen above you, um, what is understanding? When a student knows a lot of facts, that's a list of things that the student can do. The student can identify, they can tell, they can remember. As you are well aware, our state assessment, the MSA that we've taken for the last several years, basically measures this. What do our students know? What facts do they know? And that's the measurement that, that our students were tested on. As you're also well aware, our students are going to be um, facing a different test in about a month, the park assessment. We know that the park is designed to actually give our students the opportunity go, to go way beyond those knowledge and facts, to actually use the knowledge and facts and apply them to authentic tasks. So the next um, screen actually shows you a list. What is true understanding? If a student truly understands something, what can they do? We should expect them to be able to transfer that to a new situation. We should expect them to apply, to analyze, to create, to defend. And that is how our students will be assessed very soon. I'd like you to think about cooking. I'm thinking around this room, there's a variety of levels of understanding when it comes to cooking. Some of us know enough about cooking that we can follow a recipe. And that's just about it. <laughs> Mike is in that category. <laughs> you can uh, see the ingredients, you can follow exactly what it says, and you can actually prepare a dish to your uh, family and they can enjoy it. That's lower level understanding. But some of us... <laughs> yes. I'll be it. I can't be high level at everything. <laughs> Hamburger helper. Yes. <laughs> I was thinking mac and cheese, but yes. <laughs> some of us truly understand the concept of cooking. And when we truly understand the concept of cooking, we can take multiple recipes and combine. We can create something brand new. We can um, realize we're missing a key ingredient and substitute it with something else. That demonstrates the shift that our students are going to be taking. No longer are they just following a recipe and answering lower level questions. They have to apply that and they have to create and defend and do all of those higher level thinking skills. So the Washington County Public School teachers have actually always wanted way more for our students than just to list facts. We've always wanted them to be able to do things with, with that knowledge and with those skills. Our curriculum is shifting that way across our nation and here in Washington County to be a more understanding focused curriculum. So now you're probably asking, how does technology impact? We believe all of that, but what will technology do? Well, I believe technology, the most important thing is that we continue to keep our eyes focused on the student learning. If we keep our eyes focused on student learning, we can then ask ourselves some very important questions around technology. How can technology help me be more efficient with my instruction? How can I use time more wisely and be more productive with my instruction? How can technology allow me to give feedback to my students in ways I couldn't otherwise do? And when I give feedback, they can make immediate adjustments and have developed deeper understanding. How can technology help me be more effective in personalizing the instruction so that every student in my classroom learns, so that I can identify the gaps that they have in their knowledge and skills so they can apply it to an authentic task? How can technology help me to be more in-depth in my learning experiences and allow my students to explore their passions and their interests in ways they couldn't before? How can technology help me gain access to content that they couldn't otherwise have? How can technology help my students collaborate within my classroom, to other classrooms within the school, and even outside of my school, and collaborate in ways they couldn't before? 
Most importantly, our teachers are going to be asking, how can technology help my students be engaged in their learning? How can they truly be highly intellectually engaged in these tasks so that they make meaning of the information? So they're not simply acquiring knowledge and skills, but they make meaning of the information in such a way that they can transfer it to an authentic task. You're going to hear today from two teachers who do that very well. Um, and they represent a variety of teachers in our in our county who are excellent teachers who focus on student learning. Dave Warrenfeldt is a fourth grade teacher at Fountaindale and he's going to share the way technology enhances his instruction in this classroom. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Warrenfeldt. I'm a fourth grade magnet teacher at Fountaindale Elementary School uh, and I'm going discuss, to discuss how I integrate content and technology in my classroom. Uh, before I get to the technology piece, I wanted to give you a snapshot about how we use backwards mapping um, to plan for our students learning. So over the summer at Fountaindale, we're provided with a professional development opportunity to design our comprehensive curriculum. Uh, we refer to this as scrolling. And what scrolling is, is where we align Common Core reading, uh, reading math, and writing standards with our science and social studies. Um, we reflect each year on what we have learned from previous year's instruction and what we know about the students who are coming to us uh, to adjust our scrolls. And this is really important for us because it allows us to plan for plan for and make authentic connections um, and to then design integrated units. Uh, and it, the, the unit that I'm going to share with you today is an integrated chemistry and data unit. <clears throat> um, within this unit, uh, this, my students needed to understand the processes that change materials from one state of matter to another, uh, as well as understand physical properties that are observed when you create mixtures and solutions. Um, Math-wise, the students needed to understand line plots with fractional scales, which comes from uh, the Common Core standards. And then they, had also, they also had other types of graphs that they needed to know that were differentiated for them based on their maps assessment that they take at the, the start of, at the beginning of the school year. Um, and these were the standards, Dr. Hardings, when you visited Foundale that, that we were addressing. Um, <clears throat> so once we've created our unit, we've done our scrolling. Uh, the next step is to design our assessments. Uh, since Dr. Wilcox has taken over, my, my priority as a teacher is to be able to answer the question, what are my students learning and how do I know? And that's why assessment is such a vital piece for us. Um, formative and summative assessment allow me to answer those questions. Um, I'm able to assess my students using formative and summative assessment digitally. Um, which is how our students will be assessed on PARC, but more importantly for our students as they move forward in their educational career, it's how they're going to be assessed the rest, the rest of the time, uh, whether it's in middle school, high school, um, and beyond. <clears throat> uh, the other nice thing with assessing digitally is that there's a wide variety of tools that I'm able to use that save me time. So instead of grading assessments, looking at data from assessments, there are tools that do that that I can then use that data to drive my instruction to better help my students. Uh, this is an example of a formative assessment. As a, um, within this unit, the students design their own science investigation. They incorporated those types of graphs into their science investigation. So for my students, it felt like they did a science investigation. Uh, they documented their findings in graphs. What I was able to then pull from that was uh, how well my students understood those types of graphs. I was able to conference with them and then adjust my instruction for the second half of the unit. Um, and in, in a minute, I'll explain how technology played a key role in that. Uh, at the end of the units, I also give my students a summative assessment. Uh, this is important. It helps me adjust my instruction for the remainder of the school year, uh, as well as uh, adjust my instruction for future years, because I'm able to answer the question, what have my students learned? And this is the, the piece that explains how I know. So once we've identified the standards, um, we have designed the units, then then is the part where technology comes in. <clears throat> I'm then able to consider how will technology enhance my students' ability to learn the content that they need to learn and also demonstrate their understanding of that learning. And again, the important piece to me is that I'm finding technology that fits the standards, <clears throat> not identifying a technology that I want to use and then finding some standards that go with that because student learning is still at the forefront. So during this unit, one of the technology tools that my students use was uh, Google Drive and Google, Google Classroom. Uh, my students use this to design, to collaborate, to design a science investigation. Uh, this tech tool is, is very 
nice for my students to use because they can be working on a live document simultaneously. Two or three students can be working on the same document, uh, which increases engagement and also cuts down on the time that it took them to complete this task. Uh, the other nice thing with it is that I'm able to provide instantaneous feedback to my students. Uh, so there's nothing more frustrating than a teacher when two or three days later after you've gone over something, you then realize that a student had a misconception. It allows me to address that misconception, find it right away, and hopefully address it in a lot more efficient manner. <clears throat> uh, during their investigations, my students use an app called EduCreations uh, to document their science observations of the, the physical properties from the, mixer, the mixtures and solutions that they had created. Um, I felt like this tool was really appropriate for the task that we were using because it allowed my students to act like a real scientist would in a science investigation. Uh, you, in 2015, you wouldn't see a scientist publish a, an experiment that they had done with handwritten drawings. They're going to have some sort of images which are annotated, and I was able to place my students into that situation to simulate what it would be like for a scientist in a real world, and they were able to demonstrate their understanding of physical properties through the use of the technology. And then the last tool uh, that, not the last tool, but one of the other tools that my students use is My Big Campus. Um, for anyone who's familiar with the college platform Blackboard that students uh, oftentimes use, uh, My Big Campus is very similar to Blackboard. Uh, we, know with the common, we know with the Common Core standards that we must integrate reading and content, and that's where research comes in and is so vital for all of our students. Uh, because I teach in a one-to-one -one environment, I'm able to differentiate and monitor the text levels that my students are reading. I'm able to provide resources for them on the spot if they have something that they want to learn more about. Um, and the other great thing is that it allows my students to become the experts. They're no longer just consumers of the information that I've put in front of them. They're able to find the information, share it with each other, and we have a digital record of that that they can revisit at any given point in time when they feel like it's appropriate. And then the last thing that I wanted to highlight for you were some of the things that I do in my classroom and why technology allows me to do that. At the start of this unit, uh, there was some vocabulary and some basic background research that I had hoped that my students would have before we started the, the learning experience. Uh, and they were able to do that at home because we teach in a dig because I teach in a digital environment. That saved me two or three instructional days, which for anyone who's been a teacher knows that that's a huge win for any teacher at any given point in time. Um, also, when they came into my classroom, I was able to more efficiently address any misconceptions that they had. Um, and even more importantly, my students then were able to come in and dig deeper into any content that they had hoped to at that time because they have access to any type of information. Um, if I didn't have technology, they would have had to do that background research in class. I would have lost instructional time. There would have been students sharing devices. Um, and no matter how much you're monitoring it, if you have three kids looking at the same computer, chances are all three kids probably aren't looking at that computer and actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, in terms of them demonstrating their knowledge through uh, a transfer task. My students were able to design their investigation in one class period. Uh, they also created graphs digitally. And because I'm in a one-to-one -one environment, uh, I was able to place them in a situation where they had to decide what tech tool best fit what they needed to do. And as an adult in the real world, that's something I have to do all the time. Is a website best? Do I need a presentation? Should I use my iPad or my MacBook? That's, a, that's decisions that we have to make. And that's, a, that, that's an opportunity that my students not only had, but we're able to choose because of the digital environment that I have. Again, if, if I didn't have the technology, um, the task may not have been possible because it, it would have taken longer, there would have been less collaboration, and as I mentioned, the engagement probably would have been decreased. Um, I'm also able to personalize learning for my students. My, my students have a much wider variety of tools that they can use to demonstrate their learning. Uh, I'm able to provide choice for them in what they want to learn, um, and probably the thing that that the biggest change that I've seen since my classroom has gone one-to-one -one is the development of lifelong learning skills that they have. Um, I think as important as it is that our students learn content, it, my job as a teacher, it's equally important that my students leave my classroom knowing how to learn content. Um, as adults, we have access to whatever information we need to answer a question or solve a problem at any given time. A lot of our students um, at home and outside of school have an iPhone, a laptop, they have the access to whatever information they need. And for some students who come to school in a non-digital environment, that's the only place when they don't have that opportunity. Um, if I didn't have technology, uh, the, the tools that they could use to demonstrate their learning would be limited. 
Um, and again, it would be a lot less authentic learning environment because the resources that they use would be limited to what the teacher is putting in front of them. So instead of me being able to guide them to a resource or them finding their own, they would be limited to what I know, the resources that I'm aware of, which may be a lot different than the resources that the teacher next to me has. Um, and then the last thing is that my students are able to collaborate with each other and also people outside of our school. One thing that I'm, I'm looking forward to doing the remainder of the year is having my students collaborate with students at another school um, and also to begin Skyping with experts um, in their field. And when we teach in an environment that does not have technology, our school walls really become our barrier, uh, which is not really the world that our students live in. Uh, so that's how I integrate technology at the elementary school level. Uh, and I'm gonna now hand it over to Jill Lawson who explained how she integrates technology uh, in her classroom at Clear Spring High School. Could we take a pause just a moment? Yes. Oh, oh. sorry, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> I must add it. No, I um, wanting to know if any of our my colleagues have any questions, anything they'd like to say at this point. I would like to just show behind you, I don't know if you've been paying attention of comments, people that are watching the presentation. And I'm looking at one, two, three, the fourth one down, consumption versus creation. Mm -hmm. And I would just say that moves me to this question. At an elementary level, there's, uh, I understand, some concept called the genius hour, where a student is given the opportunity, I don't know, 15, 20% of that instructional um, period to just create their own educational experience. Is that being tried? What is, if so, what, how do you think that works? And are kids sort of into that? Um, I actually, this school year, last year, um, I, I do use social media a lot. I use Twitter a lot. And Genius, Genius Hour is a really popular thing amongst educators on Twitter. Um, and so this, this school year, I felt ready to actually try it in my classroom. Um, so my students do do that. Um, it's uh, it's it's linked to curriculum because the students are researching and they have to write to people. And actually, um, and I promise I didn't know you were going to ask, but yesterday I was meeting with Carly <laughs> and uh, I got a phone call from a lady at the Hope Center. Uh, so two of my students for their Genius Hour project, they figured out that the Hope Center gives out, um, gives out supplies that families need. Uh, they researched about it, found out some of what supplies they give out, where the shortcomings are, and they actually wrote a letter uh, to the Hope Center asking if it would be okay if they tried to collect supplies at our school that they could give then give out at the Hope Center. Um, they, when they shared the letter with me, they shared it with me on Google Drive, and I scrolled down to the second page, and it was, uh, it was actually written in Spanish. And I, I said to them, why you know, did you write it in Spanish? So they said, you know, we feel like a lot of people might need to. And then I, my next question was, how did you write it in Spanish? Because obviously, I've never heard them speak Spanish. And they said, uh, we use Google Translate. We use it all the time. Like when we write stories, I had a, they said, the one girl said, I had a character in my story who was French. So every time she spoke, I just put it into Google Translate. And then all of her dialogue was in French. Um, so they're actually going to have an opportunity to then distribute those goods at, at the Hope Center now. Uh, because, you know, they were able to connect to a real place in our community that if it had just been them and I sitting in the classroom, um, s probably sadly, I had never really heard of the Hope Center or knew what they did. I wouldn't have been able to provide that opportunity for them. Um, I also have a group of three, three boys. They're very technology savvy and very into Google and all the apps. And they always complain because there's a Google app called Google Drawings. And they complain because you can't use it on the iPad because... My, my students are nine to 10 years old, so they've lived in a world where you should be able to use everything on an iPad and everything on a laptop. It's crazy if you can't. Um, so they're actually putting together a presentation that they want to share with Google, explaining to Google why Google Drawing needs to be inserted on the iPad, because then you could use it as a touch screen or with a stylus, which is a lot, more, a lot easier to use instead of just using it on the laptop. So. Could they code that themselves and make <laughs> some money on that? <laughs> <laughs> so, some of them, I'm sure, have some business ideas in mind. <laughs> Thank you for yep. sharing. Any other comments at this point? Okay. Uh, my name is Jill Lawson, and I teach English at Clear Spring High School. And I've been teaching for 18 years. And I was not, I didn't come into the world of teaching with technology. It was not something, I was the overhead projector and 
was excited when whiteboards came and you know those sorts of things so this transition to technology is um, it's new for me uh, I sadly still have a flip phone um, <laughs> but I am transitioning there too uh, but I do acknowledge what as a teacher what I need to engage my students and that is why technology is a priority for me um, I applied for a grant this year um, or actually over the summer to acquire a class set of laptops for my classroom because I wanted that technology in my classroom I see the benefits of using that um, especially as an English teacher as, you know as an English teacher I'm accustomed to carrying the biggest bag in the school and it goes home every day and it comes back and that's a that's a workload and that's that's something you know I have a passion for teaching English so I want to do that and that's just part of the job what I've discovered with technology um, especially with using the Google Drive is that it gives me an opportunity to lighten that load um, while still being able to engage my students because that's my top priority um, the the way that I blend technology is really he referenced to scrolling and backward mapping and we do the same thing at the high school level we don't necessarily do the scrolling but we design our lessons and our units with the end in mind what do I want my students to learn what do I need them to learn and that's all based on the standards I want them to um, to master those skills and in order for them to master those skills I have to incorporate that into my lesson technology is an afterthought it's a tool it's another tool that I can use to make that happen for them um, it's also a tool to make my job a little easier and that's the way I approach technology is what can it do for me as far as a facilitator what can it do for my students um, as far as how they they learn and what they have access to and I plan from there I still begin with you know a pre-assessment what are what do my, st my students already know um, once I figure out what they already know then we we go from there and we revisit we have you know we continue to use formative assessments and um, to tweak as we go along so that hasn't changed for me I still approach my teaching and my planning in the same way I still um, you know embrace the literature I, the literature is very much a part of my classroom there are just different ways to uh, interact with the literature now because of technology um, this is an example on this particular slide of a Google Drive collaboration for peer revision and this is what I referenced earlier when I was talking about writing in the paper load um, if I assign my students a you know five to seven page paper or even a three to five page paper um, and I have 70 students that's a heavy bag for me and not just a heavy bag that is a very that's a time-consuming process to go through that um, and if if you're going to give it give them the feedback they need and deserve um, and Google Drive what I found is really it condenses the time that I spend grading um, because it's a click it's a highlight and a click and I can make comments um, when they're doing it in class it's live and I can function and interact with them live which is uh, it's amazing to me that I can that I can do that and I can give them that immediate feedback I don't have to as he referenced wait that two or three days and say oh you know by the way your your structure here is is off let's let's revisit that by the time they work through that paper in a full process I mean we're talking a week week and a half of of going through that when we have this opportunity with the technology to work on it live um, one of the things I do is put them in groups of four or five and they all work on the same paper at the same time with the Google Drive they all can log into that paper um, the student shares it with his or her group they all log in and they make comments they're highlighting they're commenting they're making suggestions I'm able to also log in and work with the group and one of the other bonuses is that now I can guide them even in peer revision which is something I've not really you're not able, able to do that you're not able to say oh you know that wasn't a good comment and you know let's let's guide them in a different direction or you know maybe that I know you you think that's the grammatical correction of that but it's not um, so now I can say I can type a comment under there and say well let's try this instead because that's not 
going to fix that. So that's that live interaction that I have with them, and um, they appreciate it, um, and it, it definitely enhances their, their learning. I, I see their writing improving. I see them um, making a better effort to, to edit and take ownership of their work, which is, um, you know, that's what we want. As English teachers, we want them to own it and, and to do their very best and to learn those skills to become better writers, not just for now, but for that college and career. Um, the, this particular slide shows my interaction with a student. Now you can see it's like completely highlighted. Um, and this, this was an aspect of this live interaction and collaboration that I, I don't think I saw coming when I started using technology. Um, I wanted to use technology because I wanted to enhance their learning. I wanted to also alleviate my paper load. That was, you know, a very honest reason that I wanted to do that. But this particular interaction with a student who, um, you know, for the first month prior to, I didn't have my laptops for the first month. It took a little while to get all that together. Um, I noticed right off the bat that this was a very introverted girl. She's very shy, sweet girl, but I could just tell she was just, you know, when you walk around her desk, she's the one that looks down and she doesn't want to look up and make eye contact. Um, and through this particular dialogue with her, um, you flip forward, flip back, sorry. Um, <laughs> through this dialogue with her, you know, I started trying to interact with her a little bit on a more, you know, personal level to build that relationship. And, you know, one of the, the comments that I made was, uh, you know, this is another run-on. What are we going to do with these run-ons? And I put a little smiley face, and, she, you know, she turns around and she looks up at me and she smiles. And, you know, I'm able to smile. And, and she's felt comfortable dialoguing with me this way. Um, and that was something I wasn't able to do before with her. She just wanted to hide in her little circle of her desk there in her space. So for me, the Google Drive and just that live interaction that technology allows you has really enhanced my relationships with a lot of my students. I still have those students who are outgoing and they're going to raise their hand and they're going to jump in there. But I now have students who feel more comfortable jumping in there digitally. You know, let me make a comment here, whereas I wouldn't raise my hand and do that. And so that has enhanced the discussions and the dialogue in my classroom, even though it's electronic they are still interacting in that way. Um, this is uh, an example of a form of assessment that I use. Um, as English teachers, we want them reading, we want them annotating, we want them interacting with the text. Um, this is Salvation by Langston Hughes, and what I did was upload the text to the Google Drive so that the students could annotate um, digitally. And, through that annotation, I, again, am also, they can share that with me. They can share it with a group. They can annotate together and talk about what they see in the literature. And um, it provides that um, feedback and that interaction that they wouldn't necessarily otherwise get because they have everybody, you know, not everybody, but their group participating at the same time with that. So, um for me, using technology with the literature and, and uh, with writing, it has definitely enhanced my classroom. It is not the end-all be-all for my classroom. I still very much um, see value in those face-to-face -face discussions. We, I still believe in Socratic seminar and having that, you know, deeper levels of questioning where we're interacting as a class. Um, I want them to hold the book still. I'm okay with that. I want them to have the Great Gatsby in their hand and to, you know, have a copy that they can annotate and talk about. I want them to read it. And those things are still happening in my classroom. But where I see an opportunity to enhance my classroom or enhance their learning, or more importantly, to engage them. And I know he referenced that um, a good bit. I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old at home, and they love their technology. They want to be on it. And I, of course, because I'm a teacher, I want them using those learning apps, and, and I have them using those, and they want them. And they want to learn that way, and that's the way they are learning. So for me, I recognize that that's how I'm going to engage my students 
that's what they want. They want to have their hands on it. They want to use it. They want to be able to interact. Um, one of the things that I mentioned up here in this slide is GradeCam. Um, and GradeCam is basically an electronic Scantron um, device or, or a platform, rather, um, through the web. And uh, I use this for testing, and my students will, especially with my pre-assessments, because it allows me to target the standards. I can give them specific questions about characterization, theme, whatever it is that I'm looking to accomplish in that unit. And in that pre-assessment, I give them those questions. And then through the Scantron, I have immediate data. I know 68% of my kids have not mastered this standard. They don't get it. They need a lot of help. 98% with this standard, they're hitting it out of the ballpark. So for me, I can tweak my lessons and my unit to focus on those standards that I know they need more help in and that they need a little more practice with. So those are some of the technology tools that I use that really help me as a teacher and, and help with my planning. Um, the, this is another form of assessment that I've used. And this is fun and a fun way of using technology, but also being able to see that they get it, that they understand it. Um, the standard here is to determine a theme or central idea of a text and analyze in detail its development over the course of the text, including how it emerges and is shaped and refined by specific details providing an objective summary of the text. Now, I used this particular piece of technology with a graphic organizer and notebook paper. They, they wrote their response for this. But what they did here... Your colleagues are laughing. Over I know they I are. I <laughs> because I said Because I said notebook paper. <laughs> I knew where they were. <laughs> um, but what they did here, if you're familiar with The Great Gatsby, this is a representation of the Valley of Ashes. And this was my class, or this particular group, coming together and saying, okay, what are the details about the Valley of Ashes that promote a specific theme? And on paper, they put that together, and then they gave this visual representation of it. So I know that they're pulling those details. They see, you know, what F. Scott Fitzgerald wanted them to see, wanted them to get from that piece of literature. So, and this is just a fun way. It's engaging. They wanted to do this. Um, so it's another exciting form of technology for them. Where's my, my tapper? <laughs> Okay. Tapper. Tapper. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I think you skipped one. Okay. All right. So since I've been fortunate enough to have technology, um, I have been able to open some doors for my students and allow them to interact with people outside of my classroom that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise, or may have been more challenging to do otherwise. Um, last year with my AP Lang class, I had a FaceTime interview with a regional marketing manager of Comcast Spotlight, who, you know, her goal is to, um, you know, market for different companies and to <coughs> produce that marketing on, or produce the um, commercials and advertising through Comcast. Um, and they were able to dialogue with her about persuasive appeals. You know, how do we use persuasive appeals in real life? You know, what, you know, beyond just recognizing it in a piece of literature, why do they need to know that to go forward? So this enhanced that learning experience for them. They were really able to prepare some interview questions and talk to that um, individual about that. Um, this year, um, in reading Shooting an Elephant by George Orwell, I wanted the students to be able to connect um, his political background with um, that particular text and how it influenced that text. Um, so I had students who were emailing um, and calling um, professors of Asian studies and asking them about that political atmosphere in Burma, you know, and what that was like, and, and, and taking from that their own analysis of how that influenced him or how that could have influenced his writing. So there is much a much greater interaction with the text, with the literature, because they're able to branch out and 
connect with people who are experts in the field. And that's, as a teacher, that's what we want to do. We want to facilitate that learning. We want to open that door for them and say, here, step out there and call this person. Send an email. You know, what's the worst that's, you know, what's going to happen? They say no, or I'm busy. Um, and they, they discovered that they're able to do that. So I think it's allowing them to stretch a little bit. Um, and it's also keeping them in that or allowing them to um, to work with their technology, which they again they love to do. Um, technology has made my lessons more exciting. I accomplish more in class. It saves time. I give better feedback. You can see that through the Google Drive. Um, it's enhanced my relationships with my students, um, and it's just it's something that again I'm not tech savvy, but I'm. I'm learning and I want to learn because I see what it does for my students. Um, professionally, I know that there's reservation about how teachers will adapt to the using technology in the classroom. And again, I'm, I have 18 years of experience. I, I started when, again, the whiteboards, the overhead projectors, um, it's slow. It's slow going. I started with a uh, you know, doing a survey, an, an electronic survey. I said, we'll start small. We'll, we'll do this. Um, and I'm gradually finding more and more tools that I can use. And it's all out there. And it's really a matter of just sharing those best practices with each other. Um, currently, what you're looking at now is called blendspace.com. And this is an amazing tool for uh, history or science. I use it as well, but I could definitely see a benefit um, for a history or science teacher because that entire right column is all icons of different digital resources that that teacher can just click and drag over into one of those blocks and you can walk your students through a lesson and sharing with them um, videos, images, other people's lessons and units and um, things that they've discovered, other presentations that students have created. And um, I introduced this to a history teacher, a colleague of mine who is, is not, um, sh she's slow transitioning as well, we'll say, probably a little, she's right behind me and we're working together. I'm trying to pull her up. So, um, and she, she's reluctant. But when I showed her this, she said, Oh, this is these are the things I look for when I want to put a lesson together. I think, oh, I wish I had a, you know, an image of of this, you know, that I could really incorporate into my lesson. And I'm, you know, I said it's right here. And, you know, then they have access to it and you can walk them through it. So, she's getting excited. She's she's on board. Um, <laughs> and I think that's the way it's going to go. I think it's gradual, but I do think it's necessary, and I think we can all help each other. Um, you know, all teachers can help each other and feed off of each other and, and in, engage students in this way. So I'm excited about it, and I, I, I want you guys to be excited about it, too. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to share with you today, and I'm going to turn it back to Mike. Could we pause one more time? Please? Absolutely. Oh, sure. Any questions? I know we have a couple of English teachers here that might want to have a go at this. What's that? Your microphone Thank you. Oh. There you go. Oh. Whoops. Twice. Okay. okay. There are two English teachers here, and I was just wondering if that happened to have any consideration for who came and presented because she really made me excited. I think I'll go back into teaching. <laughs> I mean, it's like you did this on purpose, correct? <laughs> <laughs> You realize no one's going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I do, but remember, I, I know that that's exactly what happened. I'm, of course, you, you and I work together as but English yeah. teachers. Uh, and I was, as an English teacher, have just been ex excited, as a former English teacher as well, just been excited about what was happening in Jill's classroom. And knowing that paper load that we as English teachers always have to carry uh, and watching the transformation that was occurring in her classroom in regard to peer editing. I thought back to when we were having students peer edit and having them 
make comments, sometimes didn't always work to the best of what we wanted it to be. But I, as I would walk into her classroom and I would see the kids commenting on each other's papers and what they were saying to each other and how it was, how it was changing what they were doing was amazing. So um, Jill, like she said, uh, you know, this was her first year. She came to me with this idea last year at the end of the year, and I said, if you want to do this, let's uh, work. We'll write the grant. Um, she put all of it together um, and was just chomping at the bit and has just done an exceptional job. Uh, but I do think that the paper load and what I have seen, you know, also as an English teacher, just was amazing, and I thought it would be important to hear that. Do you see any downside to this at all? I mean, is there is there any problem that needs to be addressed. Um, I don't see it as a downside, but I think once we move this way, and I'm sure it's part of the plan, is to make sure that the technology functions. That's probably, I mean, that's always the biggest concern is that, but I will be honest with you, we have not had, uh, there have been days where server's down, knock on wood, yes, I better be knocking, <laughs> but uh, for the most part, it, it's working, and I've, I, Maybe I'm just lucky that the days I'm using it, everything's a go. So, because <laughs> I don't use it every day. But what percentage of time in your class would you say you Ooh. work with this? I would say probably just in general, like probably 75 to 80 percent. I've really pulled it into my yes. It's now are once you, you once you address the writing aspect of it, because that is so much a part of what we do. Yes. If we're writing, they're on it because. That, that interaction is there, that feedback is there, and that's, to me, that's just a, a strong point. So I use it a lot. <laughs> and, you, and I'll just make, can I just make one up? Let Mrs. Fisher Sorry. before she, she You had some questions. Oh. Oh, going back to the um, peer review, what makes the difference? What difference? And, and the difference in their answers, whether they're doing it just individually, like we used oh. to do it on paper, right. and doing it on a computer, is it? Can everybody in the class see? Depends who you want. What Jill writes about Tom's paper in their group. In this yes. case, everybody in their can group, see. Okay. and I can see because I can see where that would make a difference. Yes, if and, they and know I can see. Are seeing their comments. Yeah, they know I'm logged in as well. It has a, there's a little button for each person who's on the paper. And they know who's who's there, so they know I'm I'm watching, and and they you know they they can't make those little silly comments, and uh, they do, but <laughs> I usually I usually follow that with a comment. <laughs> Stay on task. <laughs> so, Mrs. Fisher, this presentation is an example that we actually shared amongst ourselves, and we were all working on the same presentation at the exact same time. You kind of determine who sees who has the right to edit, who has the right to engage. So it's, it can be as big or as small as you like it. Any other questions before we move on? I'm going to make a comment about not using I was, technology. I was just going to say in, the, uh, yeah. in, in regard to your, your question, I there were some people who had come into school to visit, and so I was walking them around to different classrooms, and I took them into Jill's room, and they were actually uh, working, they were having a Socratic seminar that day. Um, and at the end of the day, she walked up and she said, I'm sorry I wasn't using technology. I said, don't be sorry. I said, it was awesome. I said, it was a great lesson. Um, and, you know, it's not, and I think Dr. Wilcox alluded to this, we're now not, it's not an event now. It's part of what we do. Um, I loved going into a room that day and seeing that it was a Socratic seminar and that kids were, were engaged with the text and they were working off of one question. I wasn't going in there specifically saying, hey, I want to see technology. I knew I was going in there to see some great teaching that day in each and every room that I walk into in Clear Spring High School. Um, so um, I, that was a good question. I like that question. It was a good question. I just wanted to make sure I made note of that. Thank you. Thank you. So where we find ourselves right now is we have eight Vanguard, Vanguard schools that are waiting to be noticed that we're going to move forward. We're not really looking for your approval to note which schools participate or to say yay or nay to the Vanguard schools. And we have resources set aside by the action of this board to move ahead. But the technology plan, as it evolves, is going to require the application of additional resources. So what we're really looking for from you is simply 
a consensus to say that this is something you want us to continue to move forward on. That, you know, as we bring you funding proposals, you'll view them in the light of the comments that you've seen here, that we are improving the world of instruction. And we're doing so in a thoughtful and coherent manner. Um, as I said, um, we've been moving towards this point for the better part of three years. I think that's a part of the reason that I was asked to come to Washington County by your, the, this board. Um, I want to share something with you, and then I'm going to try to grab the screen for a second, Jamie. Um, earlier this year, I, I wrote to you, uh, board members, and I said, you know, this work did not start as a one-to-one -one initiative, nor did it start as a technology issue. It is never about doing something splashy. It was not about a uh, Me Too reaction to other districts where there is investment in t digital learning. It's always been and continues to be about our students and the world they currently live in and will live in. While none of us can foretell the future, it's probably safe to say that our students' lives will be more blended with te technologically than our lives are today. It's probably safe to say that the rate of discovery and the need for our students to access information in support of discovery or the application of discovery will increase. I go on to say that our students will participate in a world that is more interconnected, which moves at a pace that can and continues to increase and at the same time is much less forgiving than the world that we currently live in. And I want to share something with you right now because as we were sitting here, my sister who is in Iowa sent me an email. And I want to show you the consequence of not having access to technology. Now, and, and it's a positive story, but I, I, I <laughs> And you have to remember, she was writing to her brother, so it's not English teachers grammatically cracked. Um, at the auditorium. So read this letter. This is from my little sister just a few moments ago. I put it to a Word document so I could enlarge it. It says, wow, we're getting ready for a big sales kickoff. I've never felt more like a 50-year-old dinosaur in my life. All of these young 20-year-old kids that just flew in from the Silicon Valley and Phoenix. Tesla is their new aerospace company uh, partner. Uh, she works for a company, Bussard, which is a Swiss conglomerate that sells fasteners to this industry. Um, she says, I'm sitting here in my stretch, uh, please, this is my sister, her stretch <laughs> pants, her slip-on shoes, and Columbia gear jacket, hair in a clip. These guys are all decked out and young and stylish. I'm ready to give my presentation. I blocked out a word. You saw mine. Ah, I'm so out of my league. This is crazy. Now, <laughs> I don't want our kids to be in that position. That, that's the pure and simple reason that I think all these people are sitting here, is that we think we can do a better job keeping the teacher at the center place of ins instructing our kids. We think we can. We think we can prepare them for a world that most of us really can't even imagine yet. So, you know, I'm hopeful that you as board members will simply give some feedback to this group that, you know what, it's time to notice the Vanguard schools. It's time to bring us proposals that we can look at as a board within the context of a larger budget. And we understand that there are competing interests for budget resources. But as I said earlier, this involves a minor investment of new dollars and the reallocation of dollars within our existing budget, much like school districts have done for eons of time. That said, I'm going to turn it back to the board for a continued discussion. And I want to thank each of you for what you said. Jackie, you were compelling. I know. Did you like what I did with she's that? She's there. She's the, <laughs> Jackie is there to back us up because she's really the, a lot of the thought leadership behind some of the curricular issues uh, going on from a classroom perspective. So I'm sure she'll get a chance. I just had one other question. Um, are the lesson plans that you're using, do they come with this, or you use this and then develop your own? I develop my own. I know through the um, uh, language arts department, I know we have mm -hmm. um, lessons that are provided for us. I don't, they, some do incorporate the technology, but um, as I referenced earlier, you know, as teachers, we can 
we can take that and, mm -hmm. and add the technology and find the ways that it enhances what we do. So, so yeah, it's, it's a transitional period probably more than anything. So it would take some time to develop. It does. Your, yeah. It does. Yeah. I, I think the other, the other piece with designing your own lesson plans that integrate technology is just like um, she was discussion, discussing reading novels, just like she might walk down the hall to collaborate with someone on what are you doing with this novel, um, you're just discussing how can I integrate technology into this piece. So it's not, it's not a new thought process in collaborating with people who have technology. It's just now you're talking about technology instead of talking about a new discussion technique or a new organizer that you might be using. So, Thank you so much. I'd like to give all of our colleagues a chance to respond. Mrs. Williams, would you like to start down there? Any response to the presentation? I'm, the presentation. I'm not one that needs to be convinced. I, I know the merits, and uh, I've witnessed the increase in engagement, and I've seen all the great things that, that happen as a result of our students being um, instructed in the use of technology and in using it as they're being instructed. So I, I don't need convincing, and I, but I do thank you. It was great to hear of the wonderful things that, that you're doing in your classrooms. You are truly stars. and. Um, I know that it's going to be um, difficult for some people. I don't want to call them dinosaurs. They may identify themselves as dinosaurs, but there, I know that there will be different comfort levels among, among the, uh, the teachers out there. And that uh, I think we can all acknowledge that. Um, my concern is more with the plan, per se. And um, while I am certainly one who uh, is willing to take a risk, I don't want the risk to be this plan. I've worked in this system and I've been involved in many rollouts of initiatives and I've seen things done in ways that um, don't always result in the kind of uh, end product that we had hoped because we've had to compromise on resources or money or faculty or whatever. Um, and I don't want that to become the Washington County way. So I, I have a lot of questions about the plan. Um, I've, I've looked at uh, what's involved financially with hardware, but I've also read in the plan that there is professional development that will need to be funded. There are several, I think, additional staff. Talks about digital learning coaches and a coordinator. Um, so these are the concerns that I have. Um, money, time, energy, all of, all of those things. So I would hope that we could have further discussion. I think that's why we're here. So I mean, we want to talk about how learning affected, but I think ask those questions. Ask now those is a great. Questions. Now is a great time. Okay. So. If I can continue, then my, my just, yes, uh, turn. let's talk a minute about infrastructure. If we if we can do that, um, my concern now is: Are we able to support what we currently have, and will we have what we need moving forward? And to have that, are we going to need more techs? Are we going to need more hardware? Are we going to need something done to our buildings? Those are my questions. <laughs> so we've uh, started off strongly this year by uh, bolstering our infrastructure. We've done a, uh, a switch replacement in, in all of our schools. We are working diligently to finish our wireless redeployment so that every area of our building is covered with very strong wireless signal. Um, we just recently have upgraded our access to the internet. Uh, and these are um, foundational activities, things that we would put so that we can hang, I, I want to almost equate it as a tree. We're building the trunk so we can hang the branches and leaves on it. Um, and so once we are finished with this, uh, and I don't, when I say finished, I mean for this iteration, as we go forward, we're always going to be looking to make sure our resources are adequate. Um, our next step is going to be starting to add the, the newer devices on this so that students have access to a relevant piece of equipment. Some of our, our technology in schools is starting to show its age. We're, we're getting to seven and eight years. And Ms. Ryder, Mr. Reidenauer had spoken to that last time about the, the length of time we're keeping things. And so what I hope our plan really, and it, 
we can go back and make sure that it very judiciously says this, is that we want to be very prescriptive in our upgrades and our refresh cycles so that we don't have aging equipment that are causing teachers to be concerned that things aren't working. And that's my main concern is when a teacher goes to do, do something with technology, that it's there for them. Now, it's a complex system, and so we will have a hiccup every once and again, but the, you know, we are working very diligently to make sure that that infrastructure is in, in place. So one of the questions that you brought up is, you know, are there new positions? And I think we're looking at redeploying the existing backroom staff. Um, when Jim came in, one of the things that we did is we took some of the folks who were involved in some of the networking activities and assigned them to him um, so that he could then redeploy those resources in support of this initiative. We also have Arnold and his team working downstairs as well, providing a lot of the backbone, the infrastructure pieces that all of this rides upon. Um, the only new position that we're really talking about in this is really an implementation manager and what we'd hope to do there, and you'll see in our budget, is that we're going to convert one of the units that has been unfilled for the most of the semester to a coordinator or supervisor-led position to really see to the day-to-day -day pieces of, the, of this activity in terms of the professional development and some of those other things. Of course, we have Title II resources to pay for after school, summer school, and other times, um, as well as other resources within the district to pay for professional development. One of the things that this group has spent a great deal of time about is talking about what professional development looks like. There is some that's just in time, real time, through the help desk and other resources, but there also are a number of summer activities that they're preparing. There are also a number of activities that they're playing, preparing for this spring. And in fact, the rollout is such that they're going to start by putting uh, the, 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 the new digital devices out in these schools. Um, there will be professional development assigned to that, and there will be kind of a gradual release, if you will, so that we can learn where are our deficiencies, where are our strengths, how do we replicate the strengths and eliminate the deficiencies. So they spent a great deal of time talking about that. And that's really not just the people in front of you. That's a larger group of probably 20, 25 people that are talking about that. May I ask one more? Or we are running really tight on okay. time, and I'd All like right, to get up. around the loop. Okay. If you don't mind, you. we'll come back if we sure. have time. Absolutely. And there will be an opportunity maybe to continue this conversation online in some format that we can interact. <laughs> I think we have the capability of mm -hmm. doing that. Um, Mr. Gessford. <laughs> when would this... Uh, program start what we're what the, we're hoping to do is what we're hoping to do is is launch the Vanguard schools uh, yet this month um, early in this month um, we've identified them all prior to the Christmas time we went through the interview process and we've done a selection where we're just waiting to notify them the thing that I continually heard uh, I think Jackie brought this up is when you're out talking to teachers and I'm not saying all teachers but they get inundated with so much more new programs, new initiatives that they aren't getting the proper time to learn it and they have other initiatives that they're also trying to learn. I don't want to continue to be adding to their plate and I know one of Jackie's comments was can it wait to the beginning of next year so that we have summer time to roll this out. I mean, that would be a question for me. I know everyone's anxious about getting this done. Um, I think it's going to get done. It's just when. Um, the funding, I have questions about funding. and There's no way I can sit here today and just rattle off the, the questions. You know, where are we going to be in, you know, those seven years from now when we're going to come up with $3.5 every year? It's going to be a part of the budget. How are we going to come up with those monies, you know, every year? You might have the answer. I don't know, but I'd like to, I'd like to hear that. Um, I think parents um, need to buy into this also. And I'm, as, as many people that commented all the great things about this, I'm hearing parents that are just saying, I'd rather have my kid be able to read and write. And I know as a business owner, I would like to know how are we going to get how are we going to have our students come out of the third grade and have all the, the tools that they need to go into the technology world? I can tell you 
right now. I have students that are very savvy on the computer, but they can't, they can't read my cursive writing. And I think parents see those type of things, and they're concerned about the little things that they, that they have questions about. And so, you know, parents need to be bought. They need to buy into this program also. Um, Jill, you had talked about um, your shy student. <clears throat> I know um, students that have no social skills. And I heard that a lot. You know, they can't communicate. All they can do is, right. you know, I see it at the restaurant. Families come in and they don't talk anymore. Right. The kids are doing this and that's great. But in the real world, we have to be able to communicate among ourselves. And sometimes it's easy to hide behind a laptop, an email, and I get students, I get workers that will call me and go, I quit. You know, and we're teaching people to use devices that you really need to say, why are you quitting? Is there a reason? But they, they've come to the point where they can hide behind that and say, um, I'm calling in sick. And I think it starts in the classroom, too, that we need to be able to say, you know, we have to have social skills. Right. And I don't know if you can teach social skills on a laptop. I, I could be totally wrong. But, you know, I think sometimes communicating to students, and you're saying that student can't communicate very well other than through this. How are we going to get a student to be able to communicate, um, you know, if we're, we're going into the technology world and we're losing that student that's not going to be able to look at you in the eye and they're going to sit at home and say, I can't come into school today because I'm sick, and they're, you're losing that. And then, then a follow-up on that. You know, sometimes it becomes a slippery slope. You had said, um, you talked about the books. Um, you use certain books in classrooms, and you don't want to get away from that. I know how it is with, you know, the, the employees that I have. You know, you give them a really nice tool, but you still have to do this. All they want to do is use the tool, and then they skip steps, and they don't, it just, it continually, they don't have that, the, the basic of cooking or, right. you know, having to read a recipe. They just, oh, I know how to do it. And I'm afraid that, you know, if we're, if we're not using, you know, that, uh, uh, I don't know, a 60-40, that you're always having some, something in the classroom, that the teachers are always going to go, well, we just have technology, and eventually it'll just be all on laptops. And I'd, I'd hate to see that, that we don't have books and we don't teach out of a book also. You know, I, I have concerns about that. Well, part of that, um, I, I want to go back to what I re referenced just in the planning process for me, planning. Um, I, I plan based on the standards, and the standards address those issues. Are they able to communicate? We have a section in ELA standards that's speaking and listening, and it requires that they're able to do that. So those are still standards that I I teach, that I address, and that I look for mastery in, which is one of those reasons I still do Socratic seminar, and we still have those live discussions. So that's one of those things that, as a teacher, that's not going away for me, because I also see that. I've taught um, for 13 years at Hagerstown Community College, and I have seen students come in my classroom, and they're not thinking for themselves. They want the immediate answer. They don't know how to go find it. They don't know how to go through that process. And that was one of the reasons that when I came back to the high school, public school um, teaching arena, that I wanted to teach them how to use technology properly, not just looking for the shortcut, but being able to apply it and use it to um, as as a means to an end, not just the end. Um, so I don't think that will ever go away, and I think that is something that administration will have to um, oversee by making sure that our teachers are teaching the standards, because if they're teaching those standards, they're addressing speaking and listening. And I also want to go back to, to the student that I referenced. Um, that began that relationship, and she now is very open in dialoguing with me and I think that is a way it's the start to bringing her out of her shell she's always going to be a shy kid I can't make her not be a shy kid 
but I'm hoping that she's learning how to communicate with authority figures in a way where she can look me in the eye. So I, I think it's it's still a way to enhance that, and um, and there are ways to oversee how that progresses. So. Thank you all so much for the presentation. It was much better this time around. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gesford, time won't allow to respond That's to fine. all of your points, and, and they're valid, and we'll find a time. Some of them will be addressed in the budget discussion when Thank we you. go forward. Um, and Mrs. Fisher, you've had one question. I was going to switch over here real quick. Mr. Reidenauer. No, I was just going to say that um, the piece you brought to us today was very helpful because it is the part that was missing from the previous presentation, and I thank all of you that have been involved. Um, I do share many of the concerns of Mrs. Williams and Mr. Gasford, especially on um, budgetary concerns, which needs to be an internal discussion. Um, but I, I, it does help me very much to see um, the place for this, just so long as it doesn't become the all. Um, Dr. Hardings and I just had a discussion that we don't have a lot of time-sensitive issues for our next uh, closed session, which is the next item on our agenda. And if staff is willing to extend the time a little bit, we could maybe go till uh, 11.30. Is there a 11.15, 11.20, is, are we all sort of still on board? I hate to leave some of these questions hanging while we have this group here. Is that all right with you, Dr. Wilcox? No, they all have to go back to work. Okay. No. Yeah, no, I, we can certainly say <laughs> I think they're let's here for the morning. Let's go for a little bit just to be sure we have a chance for Everyone. this conversation. Um, Mrs. Fisher, did you complete your thought? Mr. Reidenauer. Uh, can you turn your mic on? <laughs> it's, it's good. It's good. Yep. Um, no, I, I have no problems. Everything, it, it was a great presentation. There are some things in this that I'd like to, to get hold of so that I can see them again. That's what fascinates me. Blankspace.com I couldn't find. Oh, Blendspace. Blendspace, thank you. <laughs> See, there you go. Um, um, for, for our administrators, and you guys are, you know, the creme de la creme, I think. Be patient. There are some people who are going to take a little more. Absolutely. Probably the scariest thing for, for some of our teachers is that there's Fearful that there's an expectation. <laughs> Colleagues and you guys, be, be a little patient. Some of them. I would take much longer than others. <laughs> I couldn't even understand blend space versus blank space. So. <clears throat> My time does know Mrs. Williams has a couple more questions. I think Dr. Hardings gets a shot now. Sure. Th thank you, Mrs. Brightman. I, t I too want to thank you all for the time and obvious effort that you all spent in preparing this presentation. I want to thank the team at Fountaindale for hosting me last week. Uh, I enjoyed the the day very the couple hours anyway very much. Um, it, it might come as a surprise to the four over there that I'm a full supporter of this. Um, I sort of kept my, clothes cards to, my cards close to the vest a few weeks ago, uh, but I did that very intentionally. Because um, I think one of my jobs, or our jobs as a board, is to push both the superintendent and the staff to fully think through the ideas and help us have the tools we need to evaluate what is being proposed, and number two, to be able to explain it to our constituents. Um, and that's sort of the role I was playing, because I, not playing, I mean, I, I was very serious about everything I asked. Um, 
But I know there are constituents, you've heard some of the concerns that some of the teachers share with other teachers. I hear from a lot of parents who, you know, when they hear fundamentally transform instruction, when they hear teacher as facilitator, when they hear flipped classroom, when they hear all these things, they sort of, whoa. And that's why I was asking the questions to sort of see how you were all thinking about this. Um, and what, what helped me a lot was spending time at Fountaindale. And um, I think some of what I saw today here, which is, for me, the key to this, and I'm fully on board with technology, believe me, I, I live my life in it. Um, but what's key to me is, and I guess everybody's got a point of reference, I'll share with you mine. Um, we live way down in the south part of the county, as Dr. Wilcox says, you can't get there from here. My, my daughter takes the flute, or plays the flute. We had a really hard time finding a teacher who would either come to us or who we could get to. So what we ended up finding was a flute teacher in Dallas, Texas. She actually is a certified music teacher in, in Texas uh, who had a baby and decided she wasn't going to go back to the classroom. My daughter now takes flute lessons once a week by Skype. She uses a, an app to tune her flute. She has another app that runs her metronome. She can read all the music on an iPad. There are apps out there that will play the accompaniment so she can play over the top. The teacher has set up a chat group for her students so her students can all discuss what they're learning, the types of music they're playing, what kind of music do you like, is this one hard, et cetera, et cetera. So she lives in a completely immersed learning environment to learn to play the flute probably with not anybody who lives in the state of Maryland. And she loves it, okay, she loves it. Um, but what's key to me with that is with all the technology that surrounds her in that environment that she's learning in, what is fundamental in her learning is that relationship between her and her teacher. And that's what I don't want to get lost in all the excitement about technology because I believe that fundamental to learning, whether it's for a pre-K student or a graduate student working on a PhD is the fundamental relationship between instructor and student. All the technology, all these other things, collaboration projects, all of that Go back one blend second. and supplement that, but it's that relationship that's fundamental. So I think I've seen a lot of that come through, certainly in my visit last week and in, in some of the things you've described. Uh, but for me, that's the key. As long as we don't lose focus on that, I think this is a really, really exciting uh, time and uh, project to move forward with. A couple of the specific things, uh, answering Clayton's question, as far as I'm concerned, yes, we should move forward with the Vanguard schools. Um, moving forward in the next couple of years, um, will the phasing work exactly like was in the plan? You know, it's hard to know at this point because we're still trying to put our budget together for this year. Who, who knows what will happen in, in out years? Um, but I think it's clear there's enthusiasm in those schools. And um, I think if we have the resources and the ability, let's put the technology and the capability in the hands, particularly of the teachers and the principals who are most enthusiastic about this, and let them be the leaders for the school system. And, you know, there's probably going to be some challenges, but I'd rather learn from those who are most enthusiastic about making it happen. So that's where I am. I'm, I'm incredibly excited about it. I know for some of our more veteran teachers like Mr. Reidenauer, there, there will be a learning curve. But, you know, teachers are professionals, and they will adopt the tools of their trade. None of us, if we had a shoulder problem, would go to an orthopedic who said, you know, I'm a veteran orthopedic. I don't use MRIs. <laughs> and I think we should expect nothing less from the professionals who are in our classrooms every day teaching our kids. So that sort of summarizes where I am. Um, any further specific detailed questions, I'm sure I can ask as budget presentations and other things come forward. Could I have a moment, Mrs. Harshman, if you could hold that thought um, just to Dr. Wilcox's question. Um, I think it's imperative that we move forward. I think there is some uh, issue with time uh, sensitivity. We have a two-year waiver 
for all of our teachers from being evaluated from the high stakes nature of the test. Our um, high school students have a two year waiver on that as well. So we have a two year window of opportunity where teachers can take risk and students can take risk without having this high stakes testing hanging over their heads. And there is talk about ex extending that waiver, but I would say that can't be guaranteed. So we have to, I think, move forward um, as far to the <clears throat> size of the plan or Mrs. Williams, the concern about implementing plans. The way I look at it is <clears throat> I want to be sure we don't think too small. A large plan and a large vision may have to be adjusted as we go along, but if we start too small, uh, we'll never be able to get this whole concept going. And I would like to think the students of Washington County, and we all know we have 50% free and reduced meal families, children in this county, have the same opportunity as any other student in this state. Just because they live in a rural county shouldn't mean that they don't, wouldn't be able to compete in Maryland, the country, the world, anywhere. And uh, I'll put our kids and our staff up against anyone in this state and maybe beyond that as well. So those are my thoughts. It doesn't mean we don't have some hard choices to make going forward and we always have to pay for vision, the money. So we're going to do that, and we're going to be very effective and efficient, but uh, I would support moving forward. Mrs. Harshman. I just have two actual questions, no commentary, so it shouldn't take too long. Um, the schools that are selected, uh, have the teachers there already been in professional development at all? And if not, who's going to do that? So there has been um, sporadic professional development across the county uh, to answer your question very directly. We have not wanted to move forward with any process until you were fully uh, in support of it so that we didn't have to pull back from it. Uh, we are currently developing a plan for uh, both the spring and a summer institute that will uh, infuse this. And one of the, uh, what I want to really draw out is one of our core beliefs is that we don't do technology professional development simply for its sake, but we embed it in the professional development that a teacher would use to increase their craft. So as we talk about scrolling, we will show tools and how to access so that it becomes integral into that instead of kind of that isolated piece. So we are working very diligently with uh, three the three prongs of the, our supervisors, our curricular team, and our digital team to make this one professional development that addresses all of those needs so that we don't have to pull teachers in little pieces and drips and drabs so they get all of it when they need it. So they will get professional development here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, the other one was the um, tech trial that we were going to um, use. Did we get that? Our, our stress test? Yes, our uh, stress test. We just, we, just, uh, <laughs> we just pulled it off yesterday. Thank you for the snow for stopping. And so uh, Dr. Wilcox and I are going to debrief on that in the afternoon with the team. So we have some preliminary data. And so um, we have places that we're, going to go, we're working on this week to see what, what happened. And we have some places that went smoothly. So, but I don't, have a, I don't have the full report ready for Dr. Wilcox yet. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. All right, Dr. Wilcox, would you like to make closing remarks? Uh, certainly. Um, I think it's important to realize that the digital learning plan is an iteration. It is not a finished product that we're going to deliver, which makes it a little bit different than some of the other initiatives that perhaps this system has embarked on. Um, we have, I think, designed a plan that allows not only the system itself but the elected board to review its implementation over time. By beginning with eight schools and building a critical mass or kind of taking us to, as Gladwell talked about, that tipping point, then this board can be informed about, well, should we fund year two? 
when we get done with year two, the same kind of tipping point, but a much larger mass of teachers and students will be able to be reviewed by the board and say, should we fund year three? So I'm not perhaps as concerned with some of the details um, at this moment as perhaps I might have been in another initiative years ago. The other thing I realize is that as if we've learned nothing from the tech industry, what we've learned is things like this best happen through iterations, meaning that there's 1.0, 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 2.0, 3.0. So where we start tomorrow with the Vanguard schools is likely not the same starting point that we will begin with with the next round of Vanguard schools. Not only will I think our depth of understanding how implementations go be better, I think our teachers are just naturally continuing to learn. I mean, that's evidenced by the fact that just in the short time that I've been here as superintendent, we now have over 14,000 network devices. Somebody's using those devices. They are not just sitting dark. We have tremendous demands to increase our bandwidth so people have more access. We just went from, Jim, help me with that, to the full. So we went from 500 megs of access, and uh, we, last year we were using about 350 megs of that. By October, we were using all 500, so we had to increase that to 1,000 or 1 gig. And we're, we hit about 800 megs of access yesterday. Our teachers are out there using things every day. So there's a, an incredibly pent-up demand if you just take a look at the volume of Internet access that we're being asked to provide each day. Um, if you've not stepped down on our ground floor to see our server room and see the servers that are dedicated to some of our applications, but also some of the servers that have been virtualized here to provide not only the applications but the access, you ought to do it. Um, Arnold and his team have really done a wonderful job of preparing us for this next step. Jim has come in and begun to look at access in the school level. Um, I think the thing that I want to share with you, because the majority of our board members are former teachers. Um, others of you have children in our school system, so you're all connected to this in ways that perhaps other corporate boards are not connected to the product that they s s This is fundamentally about improving student instruction, and it's about our kids. But we have not lost sight of the fact that our teachers are the centerpiece to this. If our teachers don't embrace this, Mike, it will not happen for our kids. And so we are, have a vested interest in taking our time, making it happen, and being, I think, inclusive about decision making, about where this goes next and how it's, it's best used. Um, you know, I think a lot of parents, if given the opportunity to comment, would absolutely say this is a very positive thing. How do, I, how do I know that? I know that because two years ago when I sat and met with the folks from Antietam Cable and started talking about the digital divide in access, um, literally thousands of parents have now signed up for $10 access through Antietam Cable that this school system was instrumental in providing for parents. So I know parents want their kids to have access because they're buying these $10 packages. In, in, and, you know, that's powerful to me. Um, just this week, I met with leaders at Microsoft, and most of you know that there is a statewide consortium that's now been developed, and Microsoft is literally giving the Microsoft productivity tools, Windows, Excel, PowerPoint, away for free to students in Washington County and students across Maryland. And they're not just giving one license to it. They're giving each student in this county and each teacher in this county five licenses. Put it on every device that you have. Put it on your phone. Put it on your Apple, your iPad. Put it on your Android device. Put it on your MacBook. Put it on your Dell machine. Put it where you want it. Because they know that our kids are globally connected, and so are the families. So I think that there is plenty of evidence that our parents are embracing this. I think parents will really embrace it when they realize this is not a device that they have to buy, it's a device that the school system is providing. Um, and we've talked about, well, what do we do when we have slippage? Because we know that there's going to be some parent somewhere who makes a really bad decision and goes to pawn this off. 
And we've talked to pawn shops. Mike actually went to five pawn shops in his area and said, what do you, what, you know, what, what's going on? Well, first of all, you should know that in the BIOS of every machine, it's going to be our uh, address. So when somebody starts it up, whether it's a policeman or somebody else somewhere else, we know where that machine is and we know that it's ours. But we're also talking about perhaps a means-tested kind of user fee that says that, you know what, to use this device, we're going to ask every parent in the system to provide $25, a small token. But when you take that money and aggregate it up, it really represents an insurance pool, if you will, so that when a machine gets dropped, we can replace the glass in it or we can replace the machine. Um, we think we've anticipated a lot of these things. One second and then we'll come back to you. And we've also kind of talked amongst each other and we've had experience with other counties that when kids can't pay, they're still not divide the device. The fact is that the larger community kind of envelops them and says, you know what, we're going to co cover you. So we think that there's a way to deal with that. Um, to address the issue of funding, I want to talk to you just real briefly, and we'll talk about it in much greater depth, I'm sure, in the budget conversation. When we reviewed our spend on technology over the last three years, what we found is that we're spending through Arnold's shop, through now Jim's shop, and through school purchases and supervised lead purchases, almost $2 million a year on technology. In fact, this year I think we spent a little more than $2 million on technology. Each of those were purchase orders that came to the board and were approved by the board in 100 lots or 250 lots, or I think at one point we even ordered 500 uh, computers to replace the thing. This will be the first time that this board will have a systematic approach to the purchase and the acquisition of technology. And you'll know that it is not just sitting on a laptop cart waiting for somebody to be used, it is going to be used. So I mentioned earlier that there's an incremental spend. We have budgeted in this next budget almost a million dollars that becomes hardwired embedded deep into our budgets. That, I think, is a demonstration that we can reallocate and repurpose dollars, but we can also find within our budgets money to do the instructional things that we want to do on behalf of our kids. Are there some costs that we haven't accounted for? For example, some of the new apps that we might put on these devices. There may be a few. But as a system, we'll look at the budget documents and we will only bring proposals to the board that we know fit within the budget or that we can right size in the next budget allocation. And again, we're not going to put any Windows products on these machines. It's free. It doesn't cost us a penny. In addition to that, these devices across this district are loaded with free apps. Do we have some that we purchase? Absolutely. So I, I think we can account and we will in the larger budget conversations for the resources that go to this. Are there hard choices to be made? Could, for example, the million dollars be spent somewhere else? Absolutely. But that's a conversation that we have in the budget conversation. Right now, we're prepared to move forward. Um, and we will begin to, and, and, and so let me close with this. The model that we've designed was specifically designed with the board's not only political position in place, but their fiduciary responsibility to the larger community in place. At any point in time, you can throttle this activity back by simply saying, no, we're not going to purchase additional technology. Do I think you'll ever get to that point? I don't think so once you see what this group and others like them can do. Um, I think you'll be asking me, how can we support this to even higher levels? But right now, it's important for you as fiduciary agents of the community to know that at any point in time, you can disapprove of an expenditure request. That's always been true. That said, I'm going to thank you guys for uh, really, I think, a marvelous presentation. I, I want to say particularly to the four of you on that, and thank you so much for being here, for your leadership over the last couple of days. To my principals, I know you have some other principals that are waiting to hear from you, but we're going to kind of regroup towards the end of the day and talk a little bit about where we're going. Um, but I think generally, as you do, this has been a pretty positive day, board members. We have questions. I get that. But, we, but we'll, we're committed to answering them for you. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Hardings. We will have to bring this to a close now. So we, uh, Hardings, did, did I do that? Dr. Wilcox. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw Jamie go, I don't know what? if that's a good Who? thing or a bad what? thing. <laughs> um, could I ask for a hard copy of this 
threat. I think that would be great for all of us to see. I think knowing that it's been followed around the county and, and the responses from folks would like to see that. Make sure you all have a copy. Absolutely. Thank you again to the panel, all the work. It's exciting instructional work. Um, and we're going to take a comfort break and meet in the conference room. Thank you. You also have Thank on you. your laptops or digital devices the PowerPoint presentation that they used. Mr. Korn forwarded it to me and I forwarded it to you. So you have it to review the slides that you requested, Mr. Reidenauer. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Time.